Good morning, and welcome to the 2024 Smithsonian National Education Summit. My name is Dr. Monique Chisholm, and I am the Undersecretary for Education here at the Smithsonian. Good morning. We are honored that you have chosen to join us, and I am pleased to say that over 5,000 people have registered for the event, representing every state in the nation and more than 80 international countries. We are honored Today, Today, I am joining you from my office in the nation's capital of Washington, D.C. I'm going to provide a quick overview of the summit and then introduce our first mm -hmm. keynote speaker. Next slide. As we begin our program, I would like to offer a land acknowledgement. We gratefully acknowledge the Native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we gather as well as the diverse and vibrant Native communities who make their home here today. A land acknowledgement, just as a little exp explanation, is a traditional custom that dates back for centuries for many Native nations and communities. Today, land acknowledgements are used by Native peoples and non-Native peoples to recognize Indigenous peoples who were the original stewards of the lands which we now work and live. Here at the Smithsonian, many of us begin our programs with the land acknowledgement and a way to honor and recognize and speak recognition to the importance of the respectful relationship with indigenous nations. But we recognize that it, it goes far beyond just the land acknowledgement recognition. If you're interested in learning more about native communities, please join the session today at one o'clock. What's the story with National Stories? Next slide, please. We also want to make sure that you're able to fully participate in the summit over the next three days. So we have arranged for sign language interpretation and also real-time captioning. If you have any accessibility needs and um, need help or assistance, please send us a message at smithsonianeducation at si.edu. Again, that's smithsonianeducation at si.edu. Next slide. Any of you who have presented a conference or um, done a conference know that it takes a small village in order to make things come together. I want to thank our conference chair, Ashley Naranjo, for her tireless effort and work and all that she's done over the last several months to make sure that we have a successful summit. I also want to thank our entire team here in the Office of the Undersecretary for Education, if we could go to the next slide who have been working with Ashley and myself to help pull everything together. This includes our fabulous summer interns who are joining us this year. And thank you to my entire team. We also, if we could go to the next slide, have a number of people across the institution and contractors who are helping to make this event a su success. So thank you to our Office of Public Affairs, our special events team, and also the Smithsonian Event Technology Team. Our contractors that are working with us have really helped to increase our capacity. A very special thanks to Linder Global Events, Spark Street Digital, and our joyful signing team for ASL. And of course, I would be very remiss if I did not say thank you to all of our Smithsonian educators, our presenters, and our volunteers. We can go to the next slide. In addition to our fabulous Smithsonian education team, you will hear from close to 30 collaborators who participate on a very regular basis with Smithsonian education to help bring our resources to you in your classrooms and communities across the nation. These organizations represent corporations, museums, schools, humanities councils, and also national professional associations. So thank you to all of our contributors and collaborating organizations. And next slide, please. We absolutely could not do this summit and we certainly could not do it for free without the support of our generous sponsors. So thank you so much to our sponsors. Um, and you can see them here on the slide, in particular, the Stevens family who has made um, some of the sessions possible for you today. So thank you very much to our sponsors. Now, as we move to the program, I have been with the Smithsonian for about three years now, 
And I have to say, honestly, that every single day has been a little magical. There's a little magic in every single day. But the number one question that I get is, what exactly is Smithsonian education? Well, to answer that question, I actually first need to tell you a little bit more about the Smithsonian. And so let me start by telling you about our museums. We could go to the next slide. Many of you know that the Smithsonian has um, an array of different museums, art, history, science, cultural museums. But I don't know if you know that the Smithsonian is the world's largest education museum research complex in the world. We have over 21 museums, 21 libraries, the National Zoo. We also have 14 education and research centers. And we um, have the opportunity to bring and share resources around the world. In 1846, an Englishman named James Smithland wanted to establish the Smithsonian Institution for the increase and the diffusion of knowledge. And we have taken that charge, that mission very seriously. We could go to the next slide. As we look at Smithsonian education, our community has come together to define our own mission, vision, and values, which you can see here on the slide. Our Smithsonian educators want to inspire curiosity and connections in a changing world. And that, that mission is very specific. It's not just about sparking curiosity and then letting it kind of sit in awe and wonder, but we want that learning experience to be something that is a catalyst for changing our world, for making it a better future. And we want that to be a transformative experience in many different ways for each and every learner from our smallest learners to our lifelong learners. We're here to help to assist in that experience. So we could go to the next slide. When I get the question, what exactly is Smithsonian education? It really is everything under the sun. We work at the intersections of art, history, science, and culture. And that takes the shape of professional learning. It takes the shape of youth summits that we offer throughout the year. We also have curriculum that's aligned to uh, standards, national standards. We have science kits, we have lesson plans, books, teaching posters. We also have traveling exhibits that come to your community across the nation. We have a digital president, presence through our Smithsonian Learning Lab, and also we can offer virtual field trips. So, oh, and also we have we have real in-person field trips that you can also partake in and, and experience. So when you ask what is Smithsonian education, it, it really is everything under the sun. Okay, we can go to the next slide. I am really excited about this year's summit. Our theme this year is Together We Thrive, Connecting at the Intersections. And there is a very intentional play on words here. So the first one, the intersections of art, history, science, and culture are the disciplines that the Smithsonian specializes in. So that intersectionality of cross-disciplinary, transdisciplinary work is what you'll experience throughout the summit sessions uh, over the next three days. But there's also a scholarship and a, a framework about intersectionality that talks about the importance that each and every one of us bring to the work that we do. So our background, the unique characteristics, our experiences shape and inform the way that we engage and experience the world. So that intersectionality is another play on words. It's also an invitation for us as a nation to come together at the crossroads, at the intersections, to engage in dialogue and discussion, to have frank, open, honest conversations that can help us see different perspectives, engage in conversations that sometimes might be uncomfortable, but help us as a nation come together to see varying perspectives and viewpoints so that we can move forward stronger together. So this summit this year will explore a number of different topics. And if we could go to the next slide, we have divided this into several strands. The first strand, well, first off, we wanna make sure that we're here to 
cover a couple of objectives. We want to celebrate and honor teachers. I firmly believe that educators and teachers are our most important resource in our nation. We also want you to learn more about our Smithsonian resources that can help you do your jobs um, maybe easier or um, in an expanded way. And then finally, as I mentioned, we want to make sure we're tackling some really difficult issues um, that are facing educators today. So to do that, if we can go to the next slide, we have divided the summit into four strands. The first strand will focus on how can you use art to make connections between the past and the present. You know, as you look at the interdisciplinary nature of our work and our content, art museums can be a space in which they can be a gateway for discussions about history and culture and, and even mathematics and science. And so you'll see that through some of the breakout sessions over the next three days. If you're interested in this strand, you might want to check out today a panel with four of our national state teachers of the um, four of our state teachers of the year. Um, their session is entitled Leveraging Art as a Key Text in Our Classrooms. And they'll talk about how they have leveraged art to make history re relevant in their own classrooms. The second strand focuses on inclusive storytelling. And through this strand, we will really situate how the Smithsonian resources can help to tell the stories of diverse cultural narratives and perspectives. Through this exploration, students are able to understand different cultures, histories, viewpoints, and ultimately this exposure helps students to develop empathy and cultural awareness, and also helps us to cultivate a sense of global citizenship for students. If you're interested in this strand, you might wanna check out at three o'clock today, um, a, a session that's focused on the Smithsonian Initiative, Reckoning with Our Racial Past, where the presenters will talk about the work that they're doing to bring forums, community forums and community conversations to communities across the nation. This particular session will highlight a session that occurred in Los Angeles. And that presentation is entitled Deepening Connections. Our third strand is focusing on youth taking civic action. We're really inspired by how the youth of our nation are really taking uh, change and social activism to heart and integrating that with the academics and the learning process. So we know as educators that one of the most significant challenges that we face is how to keep students engaged. And so through these sessions, our presenters will share ways in which they've used field trips or virtual tours or collaborative projects to really focus on youth taking civic action and youth engagement. You might wanna check out the session entitled Youth as Agents of Change in Their Communities, which highlights a collaboration between our very own Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt Design Museum and also the Smithsonian Traveling Exhibition Service as they worked with schools in Michigan and Kentucky, and also through their local humanities councils to help to bring student youth into civic action in their own communities. And then our final strand is thinking globally, acting locally. And in this strand, which what we really highlight are models of how students are learning that require them to think about change and problem solving and um, civic action in different ways. There's a session today at one o'clock where you can hear from our very own Smithsonian Science Education Center, who will share a research study that they did with Gallup that looked at K-12 teachers um, in Brazil, Canada, France, and the United States to really ask the question about attitudes towards sustainable development. You'll also be able to hear from examples with NOAA and the After School Alliance, how they're working with schools and teachers in, in both the classroom and out of school spaces to focus on top of, topics related to sustainable development. So I know what you're thinking. There are so many good sessions and some of them are at the same time. So how am I going to get to all of the sessions? So don't worry. Um, we are recording many of the sessions and they will be available on our Smithsonian Education YouTube channel 
and will be evergreen for you to be able to see. If we could go to the next slide. I'm also very excited about this year's keynote speakers. I'll come back and talk about Richard Collada in just a second, but you will make sure uh, that you don't wanna miss the afternoon keynote today with Missy Testerman. She is our 2024 National Teacher of the Year and she is from Tennessee. She is an amazing educator. I had a chance to talk with her earlier in some depth and she's doing really fabulous work around engaging communities. Um, she focuses on ESL and she does, um, she's gonna talk about the empowerment of teacher voice and how teachers can really be strong advocates for policy changes and practice changes in their own communities. Tomorrow, we will have the opportunity to uh, hear from Nicholas Smith. If we could go to the next slide. We will have the opportunity to hear from Nicholas Smith, who is defined as an art activist. And Nicholas will share with us some of his work, which you probably will recognize, but also help us think about how each and every, every one of us can be our own everyday superhero. And then tomorrow afternoon, you will not want to miss our closing keynote with a very exciting young lady. Her name is Katangeli Rowe. She is 18 years old, and she is probably the smartest 18-year-old you will ever talk to. She has already invented a way to detect lead in water. She's helping doctors to identify patients who might be addicted to opiates. And she's also helping us think through ways to stop cyberbullying. She was named Time Kid of the Year, and she is a fabulous and dynamic individual that you will definitely want to hear from. So if we could go back just one slide, as you probably have already figured out, our summit is divided into a couple of different strands. Today is completely virtual. So please join us here on this platform for our different sessions. Tomorrow, we will be hybrid. We will be live streaming our keynotes, um, but we will be mostly having our breakout sessions in person at the Smithsonian American Art Museum and National Portrait Gallery. So tomorrow, please join us in person um, if you've already registered for those sessions. And then Thursday is a very unique behind the scenes opportunity for educators to go into our museum spaces and work directly with Smithsonian educators to learn how to bring those resources into your classroom. So today, Tuesday, completely virtual, Wednesday is hybrid, and then Thursday, completely in-person. If we could go ahead and go forward in the slides. Now I have the great honor to introduce you to a wonderful educator. I'm very happy that Richard Collada agreed to join us uh, for a keynote speech with us today. We did a survey to ask educators, what are the key issues that you really wanna learn more about? And one of the top primary things that came up was AI and education. So today we are privileged to have with us a visionary leader in education technology, someone whose innovative thinking and dedication have significantly impacted how we approach learning in the digital age. Our keynote speaker, Richard Collada, is the CEO of the International Society for Technology and Education, better known as ISTE, and ASCD, where he leads le efforts to leverage technology to transform teaching and learning. Before ISTE, Richard served as the Chief Innovation Officer at the state of Rhode, for the state of Rhode Island, where he helped to lead a number of initiatives to improve government services through technology. He also served as the Director for the Office of Educational Technology at the U.S. Department of Education. Richard and I had a chance to work at the Department of Ed together for a number of years, and I got to see his leadership in action. And there he helped to bring national strategies to enhance education through digital learning to the nation. He is also the author of the book, Digital for Good, Raising Kids to Thrive in an Online World. And for those of you joining us in person tomorrow, this is hot off the presses. Richard will be doing a book signing at 9.15 in the morning. So please make sure to come early to get a book signed by Richard. 
Richard is characterized across the nation and known for his deep commitment to creating engaging, inclusive, and, effect and effective educational experiences. He is a very passionate advocate for personalized learning, and his efforts have empowered educators and learners alike to harness the power of technology so that they can achieve their fullest potential. So today, I'm very excited that Richard's gonna share his vision with us and help us all understand AI in a, a, a deeper way. And so please join me in welcoming Richard Collada to the stage. Thank you so much. I am uh, so so honored to be here with you. It's so fun, as you mentioned, we got to, we used to sit down the hall from each other. Now we sit down the street from each other. So uh, so it's very fun to, 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 to reconnect. Um, I, uh, um, also just want to thank you for for hosting this amazing event like what a what a great uh what a great opportunity for us to come together and and i i love the theme that uh smithsonian education has come up with this idea of uh connecting at the intersections because that's where the fun is like the fun is at the intersections it's where all the interesting stuff happens and so um so it's a great uh just a great 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 theme and i'm so honored to be part of this conversation with you all today welcome to all of you that are here um with us we there are over 5000 uh, uh educators registered for this event which is phenomenal um we also have uh some folks as you notice in the chat from all around the world i think i was looking at some time zones i think we have some people at 2 3 in the morning uh in some parts of the world and you're still joining us so so it's just uh it's just fantastic to have you uh have you here um i uh as 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 you heard a little bit i run an organization called uh, ASCD and uh and, and and ISTE these are two organizations that are really coming together to focus on how do we um how how do we create amazing learning experiences for uh for students uh, all around the world and so we'll talk a little bit about that but but the intersection that I want to start with what I want to really talk about today is this this interesting intersection between our physical and uh and virtual worlds we all live in a physical world we're all here right I think still we can we're in a in a place together in a space together uh and it's a very real world right we 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 you know we we live here we work here um but we also uh live in a virtual world, which is also a very real world, a very real space where important real things happen. And this is an interesting intersection, this this uh, this ability that we have to live in in these two places at uh, at the same time. And it leads to some interesting questions uh, and some interesting opportunities. Just think about it for a second. Our kids have never experienced uh, a time when they didn't live in these two worlds. Where, where they didn't have a, a, a you know there's this this digital space and and uh and they have dual citizenship between physical and digital worlds and they move between these two worlds all the time uh, and that's an interesting intersection that they have grown up with as a key uh part of their life and so one of the things that is really uh, uh, critical that we need to be asking and the question that I'm going to pose as we start is how do we help young people become amazing uh, uh, people, amazing humans in, in a digital world? Uh, what, what does that look like? As, as uh, Dr. Chisholm just mentioned, I recently wrote a book about this called Digital for Good. And those of you that are coming with us tomorrow um, have the opportunity to, uh, to actually get a copy, thanks to the Smithsonian, uh, for, for everybody that's going to be joining us. If you, uh, if you aren't able to join us tomorrow, you're still able to, to certainly get a copy of this on, online if it's, if it's helpful. I'll put a link in the chat there if anybody wants to. But what I wanted to do is just take a minute and share a little bit uh, about some of the uh, um, themes that I bring up in the book, because I think they're very relevant to the work that we're talking about um, today. When I did, when I started looking at this, this, this book, I noticed that there were two trends, two themes in our conversations with young people about how they're using technology that were um, concerning. Uh, the first is that lots of the conversations we have with young people are, are very negative about technology, and a lot of the conversations are also too narrow. And let me give you an example of what, what I mean by this. If you think about any complex skill, right, uh, learning a sport, learning to play the piano, learning a language, learning art, right, uh, any complex skill requires practice. You have to practice it. Uh, but 
but uh, if you are if you are not practicing that skill, you can never you can never get to it. And so here's the challenge: becoming a great digital citizen, becoming a member of our digital world, is a complex skill, just like all of these here. And and if the message that we're getting is a list of don'ts, right? If the if the conversation we're having with kids is don't do this and don't do that and don't make this mistake and don't share your password and don't be a bully online and don't if it's all the don'ts, they never have the chance to learn to practice how to be an effective digital citizen. You can't practice not doing something. It's not possible. And so if we want young people to learn to thrive and be awesome, amazing humans in a digital world, we have to not give them the list of don'ts, but we have to shift to give them the list of do's. I was visiting a school the other day and I asked, because I'm kind of, I'm kind of um, nerdy, I asked if I could see their, uh, their, their uh, internet use policy. Most schools have a policy for, for using the internet. And this is what they showed me. It was a list of 36 things, uh, 36 things not to do with technology. And, uh, uh, and the, the craziest part is there wasn't a single do. There wasn't a single part of this guide for, for students that said what we wanted them to do with the technology. Not even like use it for learning things, right? Nothing. And so we have to be very careful that if our language around technology use with young people is just a list of what not to do, we are depriving them of the opportunity to practice being good digital citizens. And that's something that we have to, uh, to, to, to shift. The second part that I want to just bring out a bit, and I talk much more about this in the book, is this idea that our conversations with kids are often very narrow, very narrowly focused on safety. Now, to be clear, it is very important that kids are safe in virtual spaces, no question. But safety is not the goal of being in virtual places. Uh, this is a, a you know picture of my daughter learning to drive. When we get in the car, we put on our seatbelt. We always do. There's no question. Safety is critical. It's an important aspect of it. But the goal of driving a car isn't to be safe. The goal of driving a car is to explore new places, to be able to engage with people uh, that aren't in your, you know, in your house, that are able to go in and 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 uh, uh, do things that you can't do without traveling to a, to a new place. That's the goal of a car. Safety is the condition that we put in place. And as we think about our experience with young people in virtual spaces, we got to be sure we're not conflating the two. Yes, safety is critical, but safety in and of itself is a pretty low bar. We need to be thinking about the goal of technology, which is using it to help them explore their world, engage with people that can help them uh, think differently, help fuel their curiosity, help them have the tools to be artists and creators and designers. That's the goal. Safety is the condition. So we got to make sure we don't get those two things conflated. One of the things that I get asked a lot then is, okay, so what are some examples? What is What are the skills that we should be practicing? Uh, in, in, in my book, In Digital for Good, I bring up five competencies, five digital citizenship competencies that we want to make sure all young people uh, have a chance to practice as they are still in an opportunity with with a teacher, with a parent, uh, to be able to get these skills uh, down. And these are the five that we talk about. Notice these are all positive. They're all things you can practice doing. Being inclusive, being informed, being engaged, being balanced, and being alert. These are the skills that we need to be helping young people learn. Uh, and, and we don't have time to dive deep into all of these. So we're not going to go deep into all five of these today. But I just want to give you a couple examples of what some of these look like in practice. Uh, engaged is one of my favorites. It's amazing when young people understand that they can use technology to help engage with the world around them and make it a better place. This is Maya Hansen. Uh, Maya Hansen uh, was uh, frustrated because in the United States, we have a, a, a juice shop called Jamba Juice. Uh, and for many years, they were making all of their juice in styrofoam cups that were just destroying the, the environment. And so she used her digital presence to start to make a campaign to shift to recyclable cups for Jamba Juice. And guess what? They did. They actually listened to her. They got her, her, her campaign made a big difference in, in, in the world. We have the ability for young people to learn how to use these tools to engage and improve their communities. And sometimes these shifts don't have to be as, as 
uh, you know, wide reaching as as what uh, what Maya was doing. This is a, a young kid I met in uh, in Colombia, and he felt uh, that it was his 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 desire, his calling to find ways to use technology to help people who had lost the ability to um, use use their their body in 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 for physical disabilities. And so he had created a 3D printed uh, virtual arm that he could control with his phone as an early prototype for the types of tools he wanted to build to help people uh, regain mobility through the use of technology, right? Uh, here's another example of somebody who's using social media to just call out uh, the amount of plastic that we put into the oceans every year that, that aren't recycled. These are ways that we can learn. We can be teaching young people, modeling that these devices here, they can be great tools to engage with the world around them. Let me share one more. Uh, this is informed. So again, we talked a little bit about being engaged. Uh, let me talk a little bit about, uh, about what it means to be informed. When I was doing research for the book, uh, one of the things that I asked is uh, to educators, do you... Um, uh, do you recommend books to your to your students? And they said, oh, yes, but we absolutely do. We recommend books and and we we think about uh, what their interests are and what their age are and 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 how they what their reading level is. And we try to match up the best books with them. And they were very excited about this. And 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 by the way, I love that. I love that we are are using, uh, you know, we're, we're getting good books in front of kids. But then I asked another question. I said, do you ever recommend um, uh, apps to your kids? And it was it was silent. They 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 weren't they weren't recommended. So I said, where are young people? Where are your students getting apps from? If you're not recommending them, they're getting them from ads. Certainly, lots of ads. They're getting them probably from other kids uh, on on the bus on the playground. But how can we help inform? How can we help suggest the types of tools and apps that young people are using on their devices? I love, and it feels very appropriate as we're talking at a Smithsonian event. I love citizen science apps. These are so fun. They're all kinds of apps that help you make more meaning out of the world around you by uh, how you're using uh, our, our devices. There are some that help you, you know, scan insects. There's some where you can take any leaf and hold it up and see what the plant is. One of my favorites are the tools that you can use where you literally hold your device up in the sky at night and it will tell you what the stars are, what the planets are, how far away they are. It adds a layer of meaning it, it fuels curiosity about the world around us. But that only happens when we model for young people how to use um, tools and apps to help them be more informed. Um, let me just tell kind of a fun example of this. So my um, my youngest son, Eli, uh, we used to do reading time as, as a kid. You know, he would always do reading time. We'd read at night before we went to bed. We always did. We always did reading time. But as he got older, you know, he's reading, he reads more than I do these days by a lot. And so reading time with dad uh, yeah, as a 10-year-old kid starts to feel a little, uh, little, you know, I don't know, a little like a, an activity for a young kid, right? And, and But I still love this time that we had together and I didn't want to give it up. And so we said, we're going to model using technology to help us be informed. And we created an activity that we call rabbit holing. So what we do is during the week, during the day, we keep a list on our phones and we share this. We have a shared notepad of, uh, of, of questions that we have about what's going on in the world around us, right? So, so this is it. We call it, it's, our, it's our rabbit holing uh, list. And, and, you know, it's things like um, what happens when a plane gets hit by lightning? What's the history of sushi? Who were the first women astronauts? Uh, how do mangrove trees remove salt when they're living in salt water, right? Um, on and on. Okay. How does a donut machine work, right? Like all of these, all of these, these things as we come across during the day, we put them on our list. And then at night, we take 10 minutes before we go to bed to rabbit hole. And the idea of rabbit holing is we go as deep as we can into learning about one of these topics that we put on the list. And we learn the history of sushi or who the first uh, uh, women astronauts were or how a donut machine works. And we figure out as much as we possibly can in that evening. And so it's giving a moment for us to be together, right? But it's also modeling that these devices are tools for accelerating curiosity. And so that's one of the ways that we're helping to communicate and model that in, in our family. And there's many ways to do this, right? But the important part is we need to make sure we're showing, we're modeling for kids that we use these tools to help them make more meaning out of the world around them. Um, I, for, for timing today, I'm not going to go into 
more of those of the different elements of, of the digital um, uh, uh, citizenship topics. But I do want to share that at, at, at ISTE, the group that I, I, uh, I lead, we have created a set of digital citizenship uh, lessons that can be used in the classroom. They're completely free uh, and they're available. And I'll put the link in the chat as well. Um, and so if you're interested in thinking about how you teach this positive approach, the positive view of, of, of citizenship, of digital citizenship, how to, how to engage, how to be informed, how to, how to uh, uh, be inclusive, um, this is a great way to do it. And you can, again, feel free to take these, use them. They're available for free, and we have them for elementary, uh, middle grades, and, and, and high school. Now, as we think about intersections, we need to ask, what is this intersection between technology and our life, right? What does it mean for the future of school? When I worked for the Department of Education with uh, with Dr. Chisholm, I walked in one day to my office and somebody had put this painting up on my uh, on my wall. And it was done by an artist named Jean-Marc Cote. And uh, it was uh, his, his um, what he imagined the future of school to look like in the year 2000, but he was painting it a thousand, a, a, a hundred years earlier. So in the 19, 1900s, or in, in the year 1900, he made these series of paintings of what he thought the future would look like a hundred years into the future. And this is what he thought school would look like, which interestingly enough, isn't, you know, too far off, right? They're, he's got the kind of book grinder thing going and, you know, listening to the books and the headsets or something. But, and we can look at this and we can laugh at this. But it's not easy to do. Imagine if you were to do this right now. Imagine if you uh, 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 were, were to, to describe what learning, what school would look like 100 years into the future. Uh, fortunately, we have some tools to help us. I asked AI to give me a picture of what uh, the school would look like 100 years from now. And so this is uh, generated by Copilot and, 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 and what, what, uh, what AI thinks the future of school will be. I don't know. We still got a lot of kids sitting at desks. I'm not sure I, I quite agree with it. But, but, you know, we got a lot of virtual 3D things happening here. The point is we have a very interesting future coming when we think about the future of, of, of learning. There's a lot that we don't know about when, when kids are gonna graduate. But one of the things that we know is that they will be working on teams where not all members of their team are human. We know that they will be co-working with AI. They will have AI reporting to them. And in some cases they will report to AI. Uh, I was in uh, in China recently talking to um, some, some people there and I made a comment about this. And I said, you know, this will happen someday. And and one of the, the people that I was talking to said, yeah, you know, it's not that bad. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know, my boss, I report my direct, I'm a direct report to an AI. Uh, and, and, and we had an interesting conversation about what that meant and how that changed the dynamic of, of her work. We just recently hosted a, a, a big event, ISTE hosts an event called ISTE Live in, in Denver. Um, and one of our keynote speakers is the amazing um, uh, uh, Sinead Bovell. And, and one of the things that she said, which I thought so uh, appropriately captured this moment, she said, when we don't know what the future is, we can't expect teachers to prepare students for everything. So we must expect teachers to prepare them for anything, right? We can't possibly prepare students for everything. We can't do that. We don't know what the jobs are going to be. We know what challenges they're going to face. It is not possible. So we better prepare them for anything. And that's the role of, of, of educators at this intersection uh, between technology and learning. Now, it's not possible to spend more than a few minutes uh, talking with a group of educators and not talk about AI. And so let's talk for a minute about how we should be thinking about AI in the context of, of learning. If you're not familiar with AI, it stands for artificial intelligence. I'm just kidding. I know you all know what AI is. Nobody has not heard of AI. I had to say that. But even though we know what AI means, uh, we know what AI stands for, um, I'm not sure uh, we've spent a whole lot of time having conversations about what it means for learning. Uh, and so I want to talk about that for, for just a, a, a few minutes here. Um, and one of the things that uh, that's interesting, and, and to be clear, just to be very clear, I do not consider myself an AI expert, and I don't consider myself an AI expert because nobody is an AI expert uh, at the moment. 
Um, somebody sent me this uh, the other day. I thought it was kind of funny. The fastest things on earth, you know, very quickly, everybody's going around saying that they're, uh, they're, they're AI experts. Nobody, don't, don't let anybody fool you. Nobody's an AI expert. We're all learning. Even the people that are building these tools that we're using are not AI experts because they're learning as, as we move uh, along. And so we need to be thinking about what are the, the, the questions that we should be asking. So for the next you know, 15 minutes or so that I have left with you, uh, I, I'm not going to so much try to give you answers as much as I am going to try to give you some questions that I think we should be asking as we're thinking about what the future uh, looks like in a world where we have this intersection between learning and, and AI. So let me start with this. It'd be curious to hear what some of the things are that you've done that are interesting with AI lately. Just go ahead and put them in the chat. Just tell me what you, you know, what's some interesting things that you've done with, with AI and, and really curious to know what people are doing. While you're doing that, um, I'm gonna share some interesting things that I've seen. Uh, I've recently asked AI to help me write code. Uh, it does a great job of it. This is an app. So, so here in Northern Virginia, where we live, our, our kids are always wondering if there's going to be a snow day the next day uh, in the winter. And, and rarely does it happen. And so I asked AI to write me an app that would tell me uh, when wh what the probability would be that it would be a, a, a snow day the next day in Virginia. And it did. It did a, it did a great job of that. Um, I, I asked it to tell me a joke. I asked it to, to give me a good excuse for why I didn't have my homework turned in on time. Turned out it did a great job of that. But AI can do far more uh, than that. You've mentioned it here in the chat. I'm seeing, you know, differentiating rubrics, writing lesson plans, uh, you know, uh, um, writing student letters of recommendation. Right, great grant writing. Tracy put there. Uh, so an AI, uh, uh, Nia put AI planned a, a, a field trip for them. You know, so these are there's some so many great things that AI can be doing. I, I saw um, somebody mentioned uh, IEP, uh, right? So, so, uh, so there's there's such great possibility. Let me share some other things that I've seen that are very interesting. This is an example of an AI tool that takes pictures that people have taken while they've been on vacation of animals, and it stitches them together. It uses their unique fingerprints, their unique uh, uh, markings, to be able to track endangered species, which turns out is far more effective than the old way they did it, which was having somebody sit in a field and ask the animals their names as they walked by, right? Like, th this is a great way to much more accurately know uh, which which uh, animals are 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 in danger. Um, this is an example of AI that's smelling your breath. Why would you want to do that? It turns out when AI smells your breath, it can tell you uh, at a high degree of accuracy if there are um, uh, dangers that you have of cancer or other diseases and can detect them and help you treat them far earlier than uh, traditional uh, medicine. Uh, AI has been used in a number of countries to identify missing children. Nearly 4,000 missing or abducted children in China have been uh, b identified thanks to, to using AI. Here's another one. Uh, this is an AI service that takes videos of your ancestors and creates AI so your great-great-grandchildren can get advice from their great-grandparents who they never had a chance to meet in real life. Now, I, I don't know if that's really awesome or really creepy, but it's something that we need to be thinking about. And, and, and to be honest, the idea of being able to tell uh, dad jokes to unlimited generations of my posterity is kind of irresistible. So, so there, are, there are lots of interesting ways that we can be using AI. Oh, one more. This is my favorite. Uh, you will be glad to know that thanks to AI, Waldo uh, will never be lost again. This is an AI tool. And this is serious, you all. This is real. You can put any Where's Waldo book under it, and it will find it. And there's that little, I don't know if you can see, there's a little like a, a little finger, a little rubber finger, and it will drop right down and, and point to Waldo in just a matter of seconds. So AI is, is of course, improving uh, all parts of our lives. But you know what the number one question is I'm still getting when I talk to a lot of educators about AI? The question that I get is how do we keep kids from cheating? Okay, fair. Let's just talk about it for a second. I think it's, I think it's interesting that we suddenly care so much about cheating. Uh, there's been some interesting research done by Stanford University. If you think that uh, that cheating is a problem in uh, in high schools, you're, you're right. In U.S. high schools, we re get reports, and the data has shown that about 70% of U.S. high school students regularly cheat. Okay, but here's the interesting part. If you look at data that has been collected after the availability of AI tools, what do you think happens to the rate of cheating? Turns out there is no change. The amount of cheating has not changed from before or after the availability of AI. So again, I, I think it's just 
great that all of a sudden we suddenly care about cheating. <laughs> we we have it for all these years, really, but now we care we care a lot about it. But but the ability to create a culture uh, where where cheating is addressed does not have to do with technology access. Cheating is a cultural issue, not a technological one. And if you want to do something about it, there's actually lots of things you can do. And we're not going to take the time to go through all these today. This is that's a topic for another discussion. But but it's things like focusing on integrity, academic integrity. It's things like just making sure assessments are meaningful and that students understand why they're learning something. Just something as simple as that makes a big difference in a culture of cheating. But access to or banning an AI tool actually makes you know zero difference. Uh, and so we need to be thinking about what are some ways, if we care about cheating, that we want to, uh, uh, to be dealing with. So, so maybe what we need to be asking are, you know, what are, what are some better questions that we, we should be asking around uh, around this idea of, of AI and, and, and learning. So, so I'm going to share a couple ideas with you here. First, we need to be talking about what we consider to be someone's unique creative work. Um, I don't know if anybody knows what this picture is. If, if you do, you throw it in the chat there, see if anybody recognizes it or give me a thumbs up or something. This is a very famous picture, and it's a picture because a, uh, a wildlife photographer was out in the woods to capture uh, pictures of, of monkeys, put his camera down, went to go, I don't know, get something to eat or something. I don't know what it was. And while he was gone, this monkey took a selfie of himself. Seriously, I'm not making this up. This is not AI generated. He picked up the camera, turned it around, smiled, snapped a picture, dropped the camera, and then went away. And so the question is, whose intellectual property is this? Is it the monkeys? Can the monkey own the intellectual property? Is it the photographers? He didn't take the picture, right? And so it makes us start to question some of our own understandings of who owns, you know, who what what, what ownership is. Um, I uh, I was uh, um, uh, talking with a group of um, uh, math educators the other day, and they said, you know, it's so it's so funny to see educators grappling with this idea of, of cheating uh, in, in in learning and who who's uh, you know whose work something is. They're like, we've already lived through this with calculators. There was a time where people thought the world, you know, math teachers thought their, their world was coming to an end because people were coming to class with calculators. And now every math teacher, at least the ones that I was talking, they'll require a calculator from their students. This doesn't mean that basic arithmetic isn't still necessary, but once you can demonstrate competency with basic arithmetic, we can use calculators to move on to far more complex topics than we could if we had to do everything uh, by hand. Here's another interesting example. So my wife is a uh, a violinist. She she plays with the National Philharmonic. She's a phenomenal violinist. This is if you're fun, you know, want something to do when you're when you're bored, go check out. Uh, she was uh, uh, supposed to play in an orchestra playing uh, Princess Leia's theme from Star Wars, and it got canceled from COVID. And so she decided to record all of the parts herself and and stitch it together. And so she created an orchestra with her uh, playing uh, all of the different parts. But where I'm going with this is if she were to write a piece of music on, on paper, with her, just with her violin and writing in paper and pencil, would, would you consider that to be her unique creative work? You, probably yes. Now, what if I told you she was using software to be able to write the, the music notation? Still her violin, still her, her notes, but she's using music notation software. Is that now her work? I don't know, maybe you'd still say yes. What if she wrote the melody and asked AI to help score the harmonies in order to save her some time. Is that still her work? What if she used AI to create the whole thing, but she prompted it exactly what she wanted to do in great description, what key she wanted in, what tone she wanted it in, and had AI generate the music? Is that her work? I don't know where where the line is, but but my point is this idea of of where someone's unique work starts and stops in this world that we're living in is not so black and white. It, it, it's an area that we need to consider and we need to think about uh, uh, when it's when it's still my work and when uh, I'm still using a tool, a very powerful paintbrush, but a, a literally a paintbrush in in my hands. Next question that I want to prompt for you is what are the most important AI skills that we need to gain? You notice here, I'm not talking about AI tools. I'm not showing you the next coolest AI app, right? They're out there, that's fun, you can go play with them. But a far more important question than what app should we be using is what are the AI skills that we need to make sure students uh, uh, gain? I'm gonna just share a couple that I think, and these are just my ideas. And again, I said at the beginning, I'm not an AI expert, so 
y'all probably have better ideas than, than, than I do on this. One of them is we need to use it to be able to seek feedback. It is hard for humans to get feedback from other humans. It's tough. We learn to do it, but it's hard. It's a lot easier to get feedback from AI. I love putting in a, a, a you know an article that I've written or an email that I've written and said, what are the flaws with this argument? If somebody were to point out the errors, what would they say? And it will give me that feedback. How can I make this paragraph more persuasive, right? These are the types of this skill of, of knowing how to get feedback from AI is critically important. Another skill is knowing how to visualize ideas. This is an image from uh, a school, and these were kids that were working with their teacher to design buildings of the future. And so they had these ideas of what would the building of the future look like? And, and, and kids, you know, kids, their imagination is wonderful. It's amazing. But their art skills aren't great yet. And they know that. There's nothing. Kids know how frustrating is it is when they can visualize this amazing thing. And the only way they have to show it to you is with crayons on a piece of paper. And it just doesn't do it justice. And so this teacher said, cool, we're going to use AI to generate the buildings of the future you designed. And so they were prompting it. Yeah, it's buildings like this. No, no, it is grass on the side so it can do photosynthesis. And, and oh, and there are waterfalls coming off, right? And so they were able to finally say, yes, that's the vision that we have for what buildings of the future uh, might look like. Another key skill that we need to be learning how to use is using AI for brainstorming. Humans, it turns out, are not very good at brainstorming. Uh, we try, but it's tough. You know, we think of one idea, maybe we think of two ideas, maybe three, but the third one kind of looks like the first idea with just a little bit of tweaks. We struggle to brainstorm. It's not what the human brain is very good at. AI, it turns out, is great at brainstorming. You can say, give me five different solutions, it'll give you five. Give me 50, it'll give you 50. Give me 500, it'll give you 500. But it also turns out that uh, AI isn't great at choosing the right one. And so if AI can help us with a, as a brainstorming partner, if we can learn the skill of using AI as a brainstorming partner and let humans do what humans are uniquely skilled at, which is choosing the right option, that is a critical skill for uh, the future of learning. Let me just share two more, and then we'll wrap up a little bit here. Uh, we need to know the skill of using AI to summarize information. In this world that we live in where we're overwhelmed with information, we have to do a better job of using AI to help summarize. Here's an article on uh, you know, you, timeline of the American Revolution that I was supposed to read for my history class. I didn't read it. Uh, so instead, I said, let's just have AI uh, read it for me. So I dropped it in. I said, summarize it for me and then tell me what it's... Uh... Hey, Richard, let me give you a quick summary of this article. Before the conclusion of the Seven Years' War in 1763, the colonists in British North America were largely content with their status within the British Empire, benefiting from... I, I'm going to pause it there. Uh, it's fine. It condensed it. I still didn't totally understand uh, what this was, so I reprompted it. And this time I said, can you explain it to me as if I'm a sixth grader? And also, can we have somebody that's a little more friendly explain it to me? That helps. And so here's the, the, the version two. Before the Seven Years' War ended in 1763, the American colonists liked being part of the British Empire because it was good for them and didn't cost much. After the war, Britain tried to get money from the colonies by making them pay more taxes and putting British soldiers there. The so, so you get the idea. You see how this skill of being able to summarize information in a tangible way, and in this case, actually change the format. So it could be something that is, is explained to me by somebody who maybe looks like me or, or, or talks in my accent, right, uh, is a way that I can help navigate this, this, future, this future world. Let me share one more skill uh, with you here, and I'll end with a final thought after that. We need to learn how to uh, put AI into role. And so often I worry that as educators, we're using AI as a, as a glorified search engine. Just give me an answer, right? And that's fine. But a far more powerful way to use AI would be to actually use it as a tool to, uh, uh, to, to, to take on a role of a, of a, of a mentor, of a, of a companion, of a, uh, you know, a, a, a teaching um, uh, a partner, right? And, and this, is, this is where it gets really exciting. I'm going to share my screen for it. It's always dangerous to do a live uh, a live demo, but I'm going to try to try to do it here. So um, this is an AI tool called uh, called Claude. You could use a, a variety of tools. I'm just I'm just picking this one. And and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and I'm going to give it a prompt that I want to uh, to to have it do. And so there's this idea of um, sorry, I'm just searching this uh, up. Um, 
I can't talk and type at the same time, apparently. All right, so here we go. So I'm uh, I'm going to go in and pull the uh, prompt library. And so this is a prompt library. This is from my friend, Ethan Mollick, who does a lot with, with prompts. And so it's going to show you how we're not using AI just as a search engine, but as a way to load up um, uh, a, a series of, uh, of uh, roles that it could take on. So so here's some examples, right? And I'm going to do, let's do, actually, let's go to one of these. And y'all can play with this this later. The, the And there are lots of prompt libraries, by the way, all over the place. Here's one. Uh, I'm going to pick this one. How about um, uh, we'll do, oh, I don't know. Oh, negotiation simulator. This is a fun one, right? So teaching kids how to negotiate. And so this is the prompt. And I want you to understand this. This whole thing here is the prompt. It says you're going to go enroll as teaching the student. You're going to be the AI mentor. You're going to help gather information. You're going to set up the instructions of the role play. And then you're going to set up a scene that they want to, to do and then give feedback, right? So this is the whole, do you see? So I'm going to literally copy this entire prompt, right? This is not a search engine. I'm loading, I'm coding, I'm coding without using any code. So I'm going to, I'm going to go in here and I'm going to, I'm going to paste this in. Here we go. Let's do a, let's, I'm going to actually do a new, start a new chat here. There we go. And I'm going to put this, that's it. And let's go ahead and do that. See if that'll pull it up. Okay, so do you see what it says? The first thing it says, understood. I'll play the role of an AI mentor and guide the student through this negotiation practice scenario. Let's begin with step one, gather information. Hi, I'm an AI mentor and I'm here to help gather information uh, to, about negotiation. What is your experience level? Uh, none. Okay. Thank you for sharing that, right? Let's add, you know, everyone's new with negotiation. Let's go ahead and start. Are there specific negotiation uh, simulations you're particularly interested in practicing? Sure. Help me convince my teacher to give me a better grade. Okay. And so it's going to step me through this whole uh, this whole series that I've given it. So, so here are the tactics. Negotiate with your teacher, uh, and you could use this for other things. And then it says, uh, let's practice. And so, but but we're not going to go through all this here. But do you see what I've done? I'm not using this as a as a search engine. I'm I'm actually putting it in role. I'm telling it. I'm programming it without a single line of code. I'm programming it to be an AI tutor for my students. You can all do this. You can all do this today uh, for free. And so this is the exciting stuff that we need to be thinking about when we're talking about um, the future of, of, of AI for, uh, for learning. All right. Sure. Um, I, am, uh, I am at the, uh, the end of, of my time here. And so I'm gonna end with just a final thought. My final thought is, what are our uniquely human skills? Sorry, let's do that so you can see it. For hundreds of thousands of years, humans have had the monopoly on on uh, on higher level thinking. If there was if there was a, a higher level thinking skill to do, it was humans. Humans were the ones that that had to do it. And I don't think we spend enough time thinking about what uniquely human skills are. Uh, and because we don't know what human skills are, what uniquely human skills are, we don't know how to be using AI to support us at being better at being humans. And we could talk all day about what we think uniquely human skills are. We can go back and forth on it. I think it's things like creativity, collaboration, honesty, discernment. I already mentioned that one, judgment. AI is really good at brainstorming, really bad at choosing the right option. But when we know what these skills are, what these uniquely human skills are, the magic is we can start to design school and learning around those skills. And we can start to use AI to help us be better at being amazing humans. And so with that, uh, I'm going to I'm going to pause there uh, and, and let's let it be uh, be your turn. And I think Monique's going to join me. And we're going to do a little bit of a conversation here about uh, about what this means at this at this crazy and fun intersection that we find ourselves at. Richard, thank you so much. So this has been eye opening in so many ways. There's a lot of activity going on in the chat with questions. People can continue to put their questions into the chat. We're, we're all over the field, everything from thinking about the future of learning to workforce, to attribution, to ethical considerations. So I'm just going to jump in. Yeah, yeah, let's go. Okay. Okay. So part of what you helped to introduce us to and to help open our minds to is, is to move beyond this question about if AI should be part of the learning experience or not. So you kind of just super bypass that. We're on this, the fast highway to AI as part of our learning experience. And you talked about the the future of learning. One of the things that you noted is that AI might be 
supporting educators or actually be an educator to a student. Mm. I want to throw out the question that maybe some of us are thinking about, like, what does that mean for the workforce then? Like, should we be very concerned that AI is going to take our job or is it going to replace us? Or as you ended in this kind of uniquely human attributes and characteristics, how do we kind of walk into this space thinking about the workforce and, and replacement, yeah. but also what's uniquely human for educators? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, and I think one of the things to note is that technology always uh, replaces jobs. It is just what happens. The internet replaced jobs, right? Electricity replaced jobs, right? Lots of, of, of technology, any technology will, will replace jobs. Mobile, mobile devices replace jobs, right? Um, but what it also has shown us, in, in, if we look over the over the history, is that it also creates jobs. And so think about the types of jobs that don't exist now that we can't even imagine. A prompt engineer, one of the most important jobs in our future is going to be somebody who knows how to do prompt engineering. That is a key role that all companies are going to have, right? There's many, many others. And so I think the important lesson learned is, is not to focus on the how many jobs are being taken away issue. The focus is how do we prepare ourselves to shift into these roles that are that are being created, uh, and, and what isn't going to help, particularly for for educators. What's not helpful is for educators who are who want to sort of wait this one out, right? Who are like, ah, I'm going to take a pass on on this AI thing. Um, it, not not going to happen. I, look, I mentioned earlier, I, I'm a I'm a pilot. I, I like to fly. It's why I love those of you in the chat talking about the the Air and Space Museum and the Udvarhazi Museum is my favorite. Um, but, you know, some people get, go to a plane and they're like, hey, this is magic. It flies by magic, right? It defies gravity, flies by magic. I'm totally fine if you think a plane flies by magic, unless you are going to be the pilot of that plane or the person designing that plane, right? And, and my point here is that there are a lot of people that think that AI works by magic. Okay, you can think AI works. It doesn't, right? It's not magic. You can think it. But if you are designing the future of learning, you better not think AI is magic. You better understand how it works, what it does, what it doesn't do, because yeah. that's going to be, that's what the job is going to be a, a, about largely. And so I'm not worried about um, so much that there won't be jobs. I'm right. far more worried that we won't take the time and energy, particularly in education, to really deeply understand the role of AI in order to be ready to be the educators we need to be in the future. So is, is ISTE and ASCD helping to enter into this space? Are you helping people think about what it means to be prepared and not think of, think of it as magical? We are, I teed that up nicely. Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, we, we are actually, so so ISTE and ASCD, we are the, the, the largest provider of AI uh, professional learning for educators. Uh, and so there's lots of opportunities to do that. We have some online courses that you can take. We also have a whole bunch of free resources that, that are available just right. to help understand, including some lessons for how to, um, how to learn about AI uh, and, and how to teach AI and model AI to kids. And I'll put a link in the chat right now um, in case anybody wants to follow up and, and see, uh, take advantage of any of those resources. And Richard, we probably only have like about a minute left and this is a very weighty question. So mm -hmm. I apologize for that, but there are a lot of questions and comments coming in about this kind of conundrum intersection again, AI, but also the recognition that what we are learning also about how AI gets generated takes a lot of environmental, it brings a lot of environmental concerns into play, a lot of ethical concerns into play. Uh, you helped us raise this question about um, kind of who's who owns the work. Um, and there's questions that are coming in about attribution and the importance of attribution and recognition. So at this crux of the ethical consideration, what, what would you leave us with as we're kind of in this place of wanting to understand AI better and use it, but also the, the crossroads of ethical considerations. Wow, you asked me that with like 30 seconds left, my friend. Okay, so listen, that deserves, I mean, it really deserves a much broader, deeper deeper question, but 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 given the time for now, I'll, I'll just say a couple quick things. First of all, uh, it is critical that we are involved in the design of the future of, uh, of these tools. So, so if we do AI right, Educator fingerprints will be all over these tools, and we'll be saying things like we need to see citations. So one of the tools that we created, we created an AI tool called Stretch AI, and we created it with citations that shows what data was used, what information was used in creating those answers. Part of that was to show we need to have a better way to audit where these answers are coming from. Critical. Another thing that's really important is just to understand how uh, how 
as as we're using AI, where and and how to how to how to uh, how to fact check, right? In, in my book, I talk a lot about this idea of needing to to be able to pressure test, right? To test the answers that we're getting. AI can be so helpful in in generating first drafts. I hardly do a first draft of anything anymore, but man, I'm not going to take what it wrote and just throw it out uh, out, out to the world. We need to be able to learn what AI is good at and what it's bad at. And 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 last last thing that I'll share, and, and again, this deserves much more conversation. But last thing that I'll share, um, which which I think is it, um, is, is is interesting here, is if we think about um, if we think about the role of uh, of AI as a tool that can that can help us, um, and and we and we know what we're you know what we're really good at, and we can and we can learn how to hand off tasks to AI, but review it ourselves. We do get better at learning what our our uniquely human skills are. I'm so tired of us doing things, humans doing things that we just aren't good at. Why are we wasting the time doing that? If we can learn to use AI for the stuff that it's good at and use us for what we're good at, expertise, judgment, right? But you gotta have you gotta have practice doing that. This ties us right back to where I started. You have to practice using these things. You have to practice seeing where the le- edges are, where it doesn't give you good results, where it's not helpful. And, you know, bias is built into all these systems, right? We, need, we know that. But there's something kind of cool when the bias is suddenly observable because there's bias in our world all over the place right now, but it's often in here and you right. can't see it. And all of a sudden when I can see it in results, I can do something about it. And so I actually think there's some great opportunities with the fact that AI can actually actually make 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 us aware of some of the biases that we've had that that aren't as obvious until we see it coming back to us in a, in a written form. Right. Richard, we need like three more hours to talk with you. We should um, do this again sometime. Yes, yes, we will. We definitely will. Thank you so much for helping us kick off the National Education Summit. Again, a reminder for those of you who will be joining us in person tomorrow, uh, Richard will be available for, at 9.15 to do a book signing. And um, I, I highly recommend that you pick up his book and um, we're going to have to keep talking about this issue in more depth. So thank you, Richard, for joining us. Can't wait. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. So just a reminder, we're about to launch into our breakout sessions. Uh, we will have our keynotes. We can go to the next slide. Um, we will have our keynotes this afternoon starting at 12, 1, 2, and 3. Um, please make sure to join us for the um, final session with Missy Testerman at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Again, Missy is our 2024 National Teacher of the Year. She's going to come back and share with us her experiences and her, her um, wisdom about how to empower teacher voice to help to think about changing policy and also practice. And so please make sure to join us. Have a wonderful summit. For those of you that will see it tomorrow in person, we'll be at the Smithsonian American Art Museum and the National Portrait Gallery. And please make sure to check out Smithsonian Education for any of your needs and resources. So have a great summit. We'll see you.